everybody uh, to our second session here for the uh, our annual Innovation Exchange Conference. Um, we have this conference over two days. We just finished our first session with uh, uh, wonderful insights from Dr. Mary Stewart from Energetics, uh, Dr. Fiona Simon from the Australian Hydrogen Council, and Heidi Lee from Beyond Zero Expectations. Uh, those sessions, had, that session has been recorded like all of them will be. And uh, so you'll be able to watch those back. And uh, if you wanted to pick up any bits and pieces from those again, um, the, that to the recordings and the presentations uh, will be out sometime next week. So you, you can look out for those, you'll all get a copy of those. Um, and also to remind you that there is a parallel session going right now with the Race for 2030 Cooperative Research Centre and they're running through a, uh, an interactive uh, innovation uh, discussion this afternoon and you have the option to flick between the two. So you can, uh, it's like uh, changing channels, uh, you'll have that uh, no doubt in your uh, calendar invitation to send the uh, separate links to join one or the other. So uh, feel free to switch away if you had a favourite presenter you're looking out for. Um, but certainly we're hoping we've got some favourite presenters for you here today. So uh, joining me today, we have uh, Joe Cooper from Sustainability Advantage, uh, Justin Merrill from the Lion Group, Sally Townsville, Townsend from the Blackmores Group, and Scott Edwards from Coca-Cola Euro-Pacific Euro Partners. Um, our first uh, discussion today uh, to kick us off is going to be uh, Joe Cooper from the uh, Sustainability Advantage, working with the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. Uh, Joe's been working with uh, environment and, and uh, uh, climate issues for many, many years, so it's great to bring her experience and it's going to be guiding our session. Uh, we're going to have a few presentations from uh, uh, the four of the, the presenters here this afternoon and, and plenty of time for a panel discussion. Really looking forward to, to questions uh, from the audience today. We'll have plenty of time for that. So feel free, just go to that Q&A uh, box down there and, and type in those questions. Uh, look forward to, to having to, to going through those. Um, with that then, Joe, I've got your slides ready to go. I'll hand over to yourself and uh, if you could kick us off, please. Fantastic. Thank you. For those that don't know me, I'm Joe Cooper, Sustainability Advantage. I've been working with Sustainability Advantage for around um, 10 years. And the people on this call with me have been our partners for that long and are quite amazing with what they managed to achieve. Um, I feel I'm in a very privileged position working with such great leaders. Um, next slide. Thanks, Jarrett. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional land of the Camaragal people where I'm presenting today and pay my respects for elders past, present and emerging. Through thoughtful and collaborative approaches to my work. Next slide. For those that don't know what Sustainability Advantage is, Sustainability Advantage is a um, business program within Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. We've been going for approximately 15 years and we work with member organisations to provide practical assistance, build capacity and share valuable tools to help make their businesses more competitive and sustainable. We've been successfully working with medium and large organisations to accelerate the adoption of sustainable practices and nurturing leaders to secure a sustainable New South Wales. We've helped more than 800 New South Wales organisations save over $125 million every year. Sister, uh, collectively. <laughs> Sustainably Advantage assists organisations by helping to establish a net zero pathway. You can go on to the next slide. Thanks, Jared. We work um, mostly under four pillars, although at times we're considered the glue between these pillars. So we work um, helping to establish a net zero pathway that's science-based. We encourage organisations to set ambitious targets to reduce carbon emissions. We map a staged pathway with set milestones to get there and we cultivate networks and collaborations to solve 
shared sustainability challenges. We work with organisations to achieve a circular economic approach to resources and end of life materials. And we work with our organisations to align corporate strategies with the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Not a tick and flick exercise, as in getting them to realign their strategy to the goals. Um, we then look at ongoing revision of how an organisation is tracking to its goals and targets. And we look at innovative approaches to um, help them achieve those goals and targets. And our most recent work has been looking at nature positive solutions alongside decarbonisation, where we can assist organisations to investigate and ensure any natural climate solutions to sequester carbon also reverse nature loss. But today I'm here to talk about a specific project. Next slide. Thanks, Jared. Um, the Net Zero uh, Pathways pilot project was a um, collaboration between Sustainably Advantage and our energy markets team. The project had the objective of assisting early adopter businesses to set science-based net zero targets via a strategy and an implementation pathway of projects to meet the target. We worked with 30 member businesses who were on the screen and created tailored net zero, net zero transition pathways for each of the businesses. We worked with our amazing um, group of delivery partners to help get the project done. And I guess um, that group of businesses, many of them are um, A2EP partners as well. And we've tried to weed out the cowboys, I guess, and um, just work with organisations that can genuinely deliver what our um, businesses need. Um, the scope for the pathway, yeah, it looked at the technical aspects of how each business was going to get to zero, but we also tried to take a more holistic approach with each pathway, looking at ch climate change risks and opportunities. Um, we found that when the how and the why was presented at executive level, it's often the mm, fiduciary responsibilities highlighted that offered a compelling case for why an organisation must act. Evaluation of the pilot is currently underway and this will help inform further program and project delivery um, and develop some great case studies uh, so that others can follow the journey of the three amazing people you're about to hear from. Next slide. So firstly, we're going to have Sally from um, Sally Townsend from Blackmores to tell us about their journey and um, their goal to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. Next slide. We're also going to hear from Scott Edwards and um, Coca-Cola are a organisation that has huge challenges in meeting um, net zero. So they've agreed that they'll get to net zero carbon emissions by 2040. Uh, and Scott will tell us a lot more about that. Next slide, please. We're also going to hear from um, Justin Merrill from Lion about their towards zero carbon line. So I'm going to finish there and hand over to let you hear from the great organisations because I'm sure you've heard enough from a government pleb. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Did you want me to take that from here? All right. 
Thank you so much for, for the intro and also Joe for the opportunity to be part of the program as well. Um, for those of you who don't know Blackmores, we are Australia's leading natural health company. We do have a really strong heritage in sustainability because our founder, who was Australia's pioneering naturopath, Morris Blackmore, knew that you can't have healthy people without a healthy planet. And so we do have this business vision for a world where people and nature thrive together. But our operations footprint includes a manufacturing facility, which we acquired at the end of 2019 in Melbourne. And in that same period that we expanded into manufacturing, which effectively doubled our carbon footprint, we also made our commitment to net zero emissions by 2030. I think the first real step um, in our net zero progress was in 2016, when we first started reporting and measuring our carbon footprint. And then two years later, we set our first public goal, which was to reduce our emissions intensity by 20%. And that might not seem like a very ambitious target, but it would have required a 250% increase in sales in order to meet that target without making wholesale changes to our infrastructure and to our operations. But we did have this view that if we set a meaningful but achievable target and then continue to stretch and celebrate that success, we'd have this um, continuous improvement and we'd, we'd continue delivering better outcomes. But then attending the Prince of Wales program in Melbourne through the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership back at the beginning of March 2019, for me, was a real game changer. I attended um, with our company secretary, Cecile Cooper, and we attended different streams of the same program. And we heard speakers like Jonathan Porritt and Will Steffens. And we drove back to the airport together and we both felt as though our target didn't acknowledge the significance of the global challenges and it didn't recognise our responsibility to address our impact. And so Cecile said to me, take the program, double down on the targets and do it in half the time. And so we started with a clean energy strategy and that transition to renewables. And we're really lucky that this piece of work delivered a significant cost savings to the group because that gave us the boost that we needed in challenging the idea that doing the right thing would cost money when it actually drove value. Um, I mean, 10 years ago here at the Warrywood headquarters, we were running tours where we had Australia's first on-site gas-fired tri-generation plant and we were super smug about it at the time. And the clean energy strategy actually meant we had to transition away from gas as our primary energy source to use at the time more green power through our retail and electricity contracts. But when it comes to our net zero target, we knew the importance of climate action for our business because back in 2019, Blackmores Institute published Sustainable Nutrition, which was a scientific literature review on the impact that climate change would have on nutritional and natural medicine. And this was the first of its kind in our industry. And what it gave us was a science-based steer of the impact that climate change would have on our access to ingredients and that real need for us to protect our natural capital. And having our entire executive team join us on this journey has been really important. Even those executives whose role isn't directly related back to this program at work. And that's because our business cases compete with their strategic initiatives for resources internally. And we need them to recognise this as a survival mission and to make sure that they backed us when we invest in more efficient infrastructure or when we want to change the way that we work and when we want to change the way that we travel. Now, a lot of the technical expertise to model the possibilities of our net zero pathways isn't in our business. And so we've been working with 2XE, who we were introduced to through the Sustainability Advantage Program, um, to develop a credible roadmap to understand all of our emissions driving impacts. So we needed to know over 10 years, how much could we actually impact through emissions avoidance, by finding efficiencies, or how much investment would we need for new technologies and systems? Before we set the target, we needed to understand what was possible. But once we got started, we actually came to realise we've got more capability within our teams than we first realised. And what we needed to do was focus on supporting that capability uplift with the right tools and the right systems. So as an example, two years ago, we'd never even heard of a marginal abatement cost curve or a MAT curve. But now that's a tool that we use regularly to evaluate and sequence um, opportunities and to make sure that we're communicating those choices and recommendations that we're making right up to a board level. And we really made sure that those first projects that we tackled 
were not only visible, but also really easily understood, like LED lighting projects, because it was important to us to have results when people could see where the investment was going while we established and built that credibility because our average employee didn't know the impact of things like vsds or changing our heat pumps for us the next step is going to be securing the right power purchase agreements or ppas for our major sites it's going to be a very important milestone because electricity is responsible for more than half of, half of our group emissions we have already started transitioning our fleet to hybrid vehicles. So at the moment, 86% of our fleet is currently hybrids, but we're gonna to move to electric cars in the coming years as well. We're gonna to need to travel smarter and we're gonna to need to travel more efficiently as well. And we really got a free kick during the pandemic because it forced the enablement of technology solutions that will uh, enable us to replace a significant amount of corporate travel. Here's the thing when it comes to travel and cars though. Technically, they'd be one of the early ways to address emissions reduction, but culturally, they're really tricky. And that's because people have a high emotional attachment to both, and they've also got a link back to your employee value proposition. And that's because people like to travel, and they like to sit closer to the pointy end of the plane, and they like driving big cars, and that needs to be built into your change management approach. Um, I think the other enabler when it comes to tackling those sorts of things is making sure that we attract talent that share the same values as the way that we see the world. And that's going to become increasingly important for us. Another challenge we're going to need to address is the impact of our packaging emissions. But we know that it's 15% of our total group footprint. And so it's really important for us to take responsibility for the materials that we put into the market. And we're going to continue with this program of emissions avoidance and reduction which over the coming eight years is going to account for about three quarters of our total carbon emissions. For the remaining emissions, we're going to need to look at certified offsets. And there are lots of sequestration initiatives that are really clearly and strategically aligned to our supply chain, because we do have that very strong reliance on the health of the natural environment, not only to address carbon capture, but also to maintain biodiversity. So to where to where we've got to so far, we really have needed that uplift in boosting our climate literacy, because we want everyone not only to feel empowered to have the conversation about emissions reduction, but to feel accountable for addressing the issue. And we've integrated our net zero plans right through our business strategy and our corporate goals. So each time we update our town hall to share with our 1200 employees, um, our sales performance or an update on key business initiatives or inform them of new product launches, they're also getting an update on our emissions reduction numbers. But if I had to rank the most critical part of uh, our approach to net zero, it's been aligning senior executive and CEO incentives to our net zero outcomes and aligning department goals, um, because we know that culture, governance and remuneration march together. And we've spent a lot of time bringing people on the journey to make sure that we're really embedding this in our culture. And that hasn't been that hard because this is something our staff are really proud to talk to their kids about. And this is the sort of thing people want to talk about over the dinner table at night. And we've had a really positive shift in employees being proud of our commitment to the environment in our culture and sentiment surveys since we made our uh, net zero commitment. So I know that our um, former Asia director used to always quote the Chinese proverb that the best time to plant a tree was 100 years ago, and the second best time is today. And 18 months ago, you know, when we were talking to our board about our net zero journey, I said, this is going to mean a lot of change, and this is going to require new thinking. And at the time, we were really inspired by something that Bill Gates had just said, which was, we can do more in a year. We overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what we can do in a decade. So in other words, I think we're trying to in, encourage the business to set their expectations reasonably low for year one. But over the next week, we'll be publishing our first sustainability report since we made um, or, or started this net zero journey. Um, and it shows that even with a full year of owning the Brayside facility down in Melbourne, overall group emissions have decreased we effectively wiped a full quarter worth of high intensity manufacturing emissions from our group profile. And we've only just begun. We've got a full map curve of initiatives ready to roll out. So I'm at the point now where I'm really changing my narrative from this will be hard but necessary. And now I'm saying we can do this. We've got this. We just need to follow the playbook 
proven by leaders like Scott and like Justin, who you're going to hear from, and we will get there. We, we feel like we are getting there. Wow. Joe, I assume you were, you, were, you were struggling to come off mute there thinking, trying to take all that in. It's such a multifaceted approach that, that Blackmores is taking. This is just coming from every angle. Wow. Super yeah. impressive for yeah. um, an Australian organisation that doesn't have a parent, a European parent, or, you know, like pushing them to do this. Like it's just, that's the amazing part about what Blackmores are doing. Isn't that fantastic? Mm. We will have plenty of questions. Um, why don't we? Uh, we'll keep going through the presentations, uh, Joe, and then we'll then we'll take yep. all the questions together, shall we? Yep, great. that'd be great. And uh, Scott, I think we had you uh, next. Next. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jared. Uh, apologies for uh, some technical issues this afternoon. I uh, wasn't able to connect how I thought I was going to be able to connect. So I'm coming to you from uh, from outer space. So if I uh, happen to be talking a little bit fast, it's not because I'm nervous, it's just because there's no air out here. Um, so give me a moment and I shall kick this off. All right. So thank you very much. Uh, and welcome to uh, Net Zero Emissions with, uh, with Coca-Cola Euro-Pacific Partners. Um, we are a relatively new uh, entity. Um, Basically, up until May this year, we were Coca-Cola Amatil, uh, and then we went through a merger with the, uh, the European bottler uh, and basically became uh, Euro-Pacific Partners, which is, uh, which is now the, uh, the world's largest uh, Coke bottler. Uh, and with that uh, comes some advantages and, uh, and some challenges, uh, shall we say, in, uh, in the sustainability space. So what we're presently uh, working our way through is uh, the integration of the strategies uh, on sustainability and in particular uh, net zero carbon um, between the two businesses. So they were, they were well established within the European half of the business uh, and we had made some, uh, some new commitments at the end of last year uh, in that space as well as, as Amatil. So we're now basically working our way through what that looks like. Uh, and on the next couple of slides, I'll sort of go into a little bit more detail on, on what that actually means and what that looks like. Uh, and if we start there with, uh, with net zero and, and our commitments to action on climate, as I said, these are uh, basically still being finalized across what is the new entity. Uh, but basically what you're sort of seeing there on screen there at the moment um, is our ambition uh, at a minimum level really. Uh, so around net zero across uh, all three scopes uh, of our emissions by 2040, uh, along with a science-based target uh, to reduce uh, by 30% across their entire value chain. Um, renewable uh, electricity is in there as well. So we made that commitment uh, as Amatil uh, towards the end of 2020 to be 100% uh, by 2025. Um, and likewise now with our strategic suppliers as well, some of whom um, having just a quick look through the, uh, the list of uh, attendees are actually on, on the call as well. So um, this is something that we'll be approaching uh, you guys for uh, in, in the near future. And then finally, uh, something that uh, is sort of all encompassing for, for that as well is around um, taking action to uh, restore and enhance biodiversity. Um, which, which has a, a nice um, sub-benefit to us as well. Um, similar to, uh, to the Lion business, we're quite large water consumers as well. Um, so there's a great nexus there between net zero carbon uh, and a net zero water uh, sort of scenario. In terms of our value chain, um, what are we speaking about? Basically, uh, and broadly speaking, it's, it's across the, the five uh, pillars that you can sort of see there on the right-hand uh, side of the slide. It's, uh, it's incorporating all of our ingredients. Um, so there's, a, there's quite a few uh, agricultural ingredients in there, sugar being one of the, one of the big ones. There's a lot of juices, um, coffee within the business. Uh, there is uh, some brewing assets in there as well. Um, I'll leave more, more of that story to, uh, to Justin in just a moment. Um, as Sally touched on as well, um, packaging is a, is a huge part of our business uh, and our footprint from a carbon perspective. Manufacturing, the traditional scope one, scope two uh, role and, and emissions in that space. Uh, equally then uh, in the distribution side of things. So 
Um, we have uh, our own sales fleet. We have some of our own distribution fleet, but we do rely quite heavily on a lot of third party logistics uh, providers in that space as well. So partnering with and working with them uh, on our uh, net zero pathway is, is going to be critical in that space. And finally, uh, in the refrigeration space. So we have upward of 100,000 uh, coolers in, in various different formats uh, all around the country, um, basically uh, selling our cold drink products. So everywhere from your um, service stations and your, and your mum and dad stores um, through to the big retail outlets, uh, vending machines on train stations and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot to, uh, to account for in that space as well both from a refrigerant and an electricity consumption perspective. So where are we and what are we sort of focusing on in terms of our pathway uh, in climate in each of these areas? Um, so on the ingredients side of things, we've, we've done a fair bit in terms of the sustainable sourcing side of things, um, especially with the, uh, our sugar and our coffee uh, in that sort of space. Uh, working with uh, the transporter of those um, commodities to our sites uh, and the processing or the, the pre-processing of them before they actually get to us as well. Um, packaging uh, is ubiquitous to our, to our company um, and our business. It's, it's, it's what we sort of live and die by really. So it's, it's very critical um, that we get that right. And our focus really uh, is in a number of uh, simple areas really, uh, in terms of recyclability, uh, recycled content, uh, and then uh, collection and recovery of, uh, of those packages once they've uh, reached their, their end of life. Um, kind of a subset of our, our commitments here in terms of net zero uh, with the APCO targets, um, basically the packaging covenant uh, commitments uh, that we've got with, uh, with other businesses in this space as well. In the manufacturing side of things, that's where everyone um, sort of focuses initially at least, and that's where our initial commitment was. Um, so basically all of our scope one and scope two emissions um, across our sites. Um, so we have four major sites uh, around the country and a number of small ones as well. So in that space, you know, we're, we focused on uh, the energy efficiency side of things. We're starting to then look into the electrification. We've got some um, renewables, some solar PV on some of our uh, sites and so forth at the moment, looking to expand that as well. Um, and then obviously we've got our commitments around uh, RE100. So we have one PPA in place. We're working on a number of others uh, that combined with the, uh, the on-site solar side of things um, is our major pathway towards uh, eliminating our scope two emissions. The distribution side of things, um, basically scope one and three, it's, it's fairly large in that space for us. Um, as I mentioned before, working with uh, the likes of our 3PL uh, providers in terms of things like route efficiency, mode switching, uh, going from road into rail and in uh, wherever possible into sea freight as well. Um, Efficiencies at our distribution centre sites, um, looking at uh, alternative fuels and so forth in that space as well. And then finally, in the uh, in the refrigeration side of things, um, it's fortunate for us in in this space that we're part of a, a huge global network, um, and that comes with uh, some fairly efficient um, scale uh, in in that space. So looking at uh, swapping all of our um, coolers out to, uh, to natural refrigerants from the synthetics, um, integrating energy management systems into, uh, into the coolers themselves, uh, improving their recyclability, and then obviously their, uh, their energy efficiency uh, in that space as well. Hasn't all been um, beer and Skittles and, and, and easy uh, across that way. And that's where uh, the program that we've been part of um, with Sustainability Advantages has definitely given us uh, a boost in that space. So i um, quite grateful for that. And the, the learnings that we're, uh, that we're gaining out of that program, we're looking to apply not only across the country, but uh, across the rest of uh, the group as well um, in, uh, in the Pacific region. Some of the, the key challenges uh, in engagement, in, in data and in technical, um, fairly common to uh, the sorts of things that Sally was just talking about, uh, and I'm fairly sure will be common to what uh, Justin's experienced at, at Lion and so forth as well. So you know, in the engagement space about building um, sustainability into business cases um, with things like an internal price on carbon, uh, 
getting stakeholder involvement uh, and engagement uh, from a from a customer and even a co and consumer uh, perspective. Um, it's really net zero and and a sustainable focus is is basically no longer um, solely about sort of competitive advantage and and that sort of thing. You know, it's it's basically without a sustainable approach uh, to our products. Uh, increasingly, there's there's sort of not even a, a seat at the table. Um, I think. Anyone that attended this morning's session, um, you would have heard uh, Dr. Mary Stewart say, basically decarbonisation is now a minimum requirement. And that's very much um, the way we're sort of viewing this as well. From the data side of things, uh, the challenges there with emission factors in particular in the, uh, the ingredients and the packaging space. Um, and instead of now relying on what were in many cases, global factors, uh, looking to reach out to our suppliers more and more um, to help us localise those and, and get a, uh, a more accurate picture of, of our footprint um, in that space. Retrospective data, um, it's one of those things that's, uh, that's always a challenge. You can, you can go out and make these commitments and then finding out where, where you actually were from a baseline perspective is, is definitely one of those challenges. Um, and that's one thing that we're sort of working through quite hard on at the moment as well. On the technical side of things, um, we mentioned before uh, our pathway in terms of 100% uh, renewable electricity. Um, the other big one for us in terms of our energy mix, which is about 50-50 between electricity and gas, is process heat. Um, so working with our teams locally now, in particular the engineering teams, around uh, coming to grips with how much steam do we actually need? How much heat do we need at such high temperatures? Uh, and how do, we, how do we look at what our transition pathway is through things like electrification, whether it be with heat pumps or, or other similar sorts of technologies. Uh, in terms of uh, estimates and, and assumptions in that space, our, our challenges basically and our advice really in this space really is, is validate and verify um, wherever you possibly can. Um, and if you're sort of just starting out in this space, um, I would definitely value consistency over pure accuracy. In, in that beginning. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to sort of get a, a, a foothold into, uh, into developing your own sort of pathway. Um, other things in terms of innovation, I mentioned before, you know, working with our partners. So we are looking at um, EVs, we are looking at hydrogen sort of based vehicles as well. Um, we're looking at how could we potentially integrate electrolyzers into our business uh, at manufacturing sites and at DC sites um, for self-generation of, of hydrogen? Um, and as, we, as some of the speakers this morning mentioned, and I think Jared in particular touched on this, was uh, a lot of these things are long-term investments. Um, so the decisions we make now are gonna be with us for, for 10, 15, potentially 20 odd years. Um, and just finally, in terms of Balancing energy efficiency versus a, an investment in things like solar. Um, in our experience, basically what we've found, and this may not be the case with, uh, with everyone, um, but with our manufacturing sites in particular, we'll, we'll never get our electrical efficiency um, to the point where we can put too many panels on the roof, for example. Um, so basically we'll, we'll focus on energy efficiency uh, and we'll, give some, uh, some also some reasonable focus to the, uh, the electricity generated from uh, solar PV and so forth on site. So, and with our pathway moving forward to electrify further, uh, the risk of over, um, over generation from, uh, from any panels on the roofs and so forth becomes lower and lower. And that is basically our, uh, our net zero um, pathway thus far uh, in, Coca-Cola Euro Pacific Partners, and I'll I'll hand back to uh, to Jared to introduce next speaker. That was um, fantastic. Thank you, oh, sorry, Scott. Jared, to no, that's all right. It's fine. Um, and I think the amazing thing that I find about some of the really large organisations that we work with on some of these projects that are quite tough to tackle, that are beyond. Um, the low hanging fruit, you know, they've, they've done a lot of that work already. It's now getting to that, the real nitty gritty of how they're going to go about, you know, getting gas out of their sites and those kind of things to actually reach net zero and their willingness to actually share information 
and to talk to each other to de-risk some of these projects going forward, I find really refreshing. And I think it's um, a genuine change we've seen over the last few years from these large organisations that we work with. So it's um, that's something that I think um, going ahead, you know, like that willingness to collaborate and share to actually change the landscape is something that we're going to see more and more of. So I, that's, it was a great presentation. Thanks, Scott. And on to you, Justin. Thanks, Joe. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, thanks to O2EP for letting me um, share Lion's Net Zero um, journey to date. And thanks to Scott and Sally. It's almost like we, we compared notes before we prepared these presentations, but we, we didn't. But um, I'll find myself talking about and reinforcing many of the, the good things that you've, you've raised as well. Um, I'm coming to you from Gadigal land and I pay my respects to the elders past and present. I acknowledge their custodianship of this land. They did a tremendous job of taking care of country and um, a regular source of, of deep inspiration for me. So I'll switch into presentation mode. And this is a summary of Lions uh, climate change commitments. So it's quite a, a diverse set of commitments. And that I hope that animation from Greenpeace is su sufficiently irritating for you as I work through these uh, <laughs> as I work through these items. But each of these um, commitments brings its own story. And um, if I work through it from top to bottom, I mean, energy efficiency or energy productivity is always the, the number one priority for Lion. Um, it translates to cost savings. And we're very fortunate that we've got some very clever engineers working on our breweries um, who, as well as being clever, are very dedicated and focused on realising energy savings and, and water savings. So uh, I tip my hat to them year on year. They continue to find new opportunities and they work collaboratively across the network. It's just not one brewery doing their own thing. They have a, a network of engineers that regularly meet and share their, their successes and the opportunities. So um, they, they do a really good job. We have some very good energy management systems at the breweries. We have submetering down to about four levels across the site. So we have access to some really good data. And again, we, we've got the motivation to dig into that information to, to find the next opportunity. And we don't forget about compressed air. We don't forget about LED lighting. Um, we find that if you take your eyes off those types of fundamental energy saving opportunities, they, they can go backwards quickly. So again, it, it's something that you've got to be continuously vigilant with to ensure that you, you stay on track. The scope one and two and the scope three emission reduction targets, they're science-based targets. They're uh, given to us by our parent, Kirin, in Japan, and we adopt those. Um, so we've got a quite an ambitious and direct reduction target there aligned to the 1.5 degree um, cap that we'd like to see for global warming and that as a consequence, it's a 55% reduction on scope one and two over the next 10 years and a 30% reduction in, in scope three. Uh, really quite excited to be sort of charging ahead in that scope three space. Joe just alluded to the importance of collaboration and Sally mentioned it as well, forming partnerships with your suppliers or in some cases your peers. This area is mostly non-compete and we do need to be more transparent and, and open and, and share um, where there are opportunities to make a, well, to at least amplify the impact that we're making by sharing the, the successes across the broader industry. The renewable electricity, similar to um, Scott, we're RE100, um, want to achieve that across the operations by 2025. We have a renewable PPA in New South Wales, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. It's a PPA with a bit of a twist. I, I think they probably all have a twist, to be honest, PPAs, but this one's got quite a a unique twist that involves our customers. And the carbon neutral organisations, we're certified through Climate Active in Australia and uh, certified through Toy2 in, in New Zealand. So uh, again, we achieved that in Australia in 2020, New Zealand earlier this year. I think the exciting thing about that for me has been, um, it's it, by default, it sets an internal carbon price in the business. And I didn't really, list that as a benefit when I was pitching it to the, the line executive team, but 
it's set, the procurement team quickly got onto it and started including the price of carbon in, in a lot of the business cases, which um, we're seeing some quite high forecasted price for carbon credits. And I suspect it's going to continue to play an important role in putting together carbon abatement business cases. And similarly in the carbon neutral products, um, in New Zealand, we have Stein Lager. In the US, we have Fat Tire from the New Belgium brewery, which we acquired in 2019. And that again is, is just something that is, um, introduces a new area that we can explore in the business. It puts, again, it puts a bit of focus on the scope three. Um, it puts a bit of focus on the collaboration with our suppliers. If you think about a bottle of beer, this is something good to keep in mind. If you hold a bottle of beer in your hand, about 50% of the life cycle emissions in that bottle are associated with the glass itself. Um, so most um, of our emissions reside in scope three, typically about 80%. Um, which is common across all the big brewers. It's a big focus on raw materials, i.e. malt or barley, and the packaging and the logistics. So the, the downstream freight typically for our, our products. And then we also have a, a net zero value chain um, commitment, which we arrived at um, earlier this year, just in time for our sustainability report. Um, but that is equals um, Kieran's commitment and New Belgium have a, have a 2030 commitment to achieve a net zero value chain. So we feel we've got, um, we feel we're pretty well covered, but again, what I like about this approach is that it's, it's, it's quite diverse in the way that we're going about um, addressing climate change. And there's uh, so many more opportunities. I was listening to the earlier presenters today and thinking, oh my goodness, when I was the process engineer at the carbon black plant in Kernel, you know, 10 years ago, all I had was a, a VSD that used to trip the boilers all the time and a fledgling sustainability advantage organisation. But these days, um, yeah, there's, there's so many opportunities coming down the pipeline, which make it really exciting and, and justify having such a diverse um, range of commitments to address climate change. I put the green piece, I didn't mean it to be distracting, actually. It was, wasn't sort of shaking on, on my slide, but... Um, it, it came about because Greenpeace did apply a bit of pressure to us with regards to the renewable um, electricity commitment. And I think that could have gone two ways for the business in a sense that I, I think it agitated quite a few people, um, but there was other people that, including myself, which thought, no, maybe this is an opportunity. And I just put it there just to highlight how important it is to have a growth mindset when looking at these challenges um, because Initially, it might be a source of frustration, but again, you've got to train yourself to turn it to look at it as an opportunity. And that's certainly um, good buddies with Greenpeace now and they don't let up, but they, we have quite a good collaborative relationship and, and talk frequently on what's coming down the tracks. Now this slide here, this is, um, I'm hoping this is something practical for um, a lot of people watching today. And it, I get a question quite often is how, you know, how did you get the leadership team over the line on these commitments, in particular the carbon neutral commitment? And I realise there's a bit of there's a bit of information going on in this slide, but if you bear with me, I'll take you through it. And there's a few ways to look at it. The, probably the simplest way to look at it is um, these three areas of what, you know, so societal norm over and above and sustainability leadership. And or another way of phrasing that is you think about it as the societal norm is, you know, minimising harm or minimising impact. Over and above is these days zero impact. And sustainability leadership is about positive impact. And you think about that in terms of, well, yeah, maybe 30 years ago you had an environmental licence from the government to pollute, right? You could put a certain amount of garbage in the river and providing you didn't go over your, your limit that was that was okay you know we're now in this area where you know really that's no longer good enough and it's about sort of zero harm or, or zero impact and then if you want to step into that sustainability leadership space then you really in that territory now positive impact and that little arrow above just says that over time and this is accelerating in fact that the community expectations are going to shift and continue to shift and table stakes, you know, what is table stakes is going to consider, is, will, will continue to grow. 
um, where you'll just to play, and this Scott made this point, to play you, you'll have to have 100% recyclable packaging and you know, greater than 50% recyclable content, or you'll have to have 100% renewable electricity. Um, the other clever thing I did with this slide is I started putting what other companies have achieved, and, and this will depend on the company or the organisation that you work for, but typically if you in FMCG, you are a little bit sensitive to what your competitors are doing. And you should be looking for those little pressure points in your business and using those to your advantage. I'm sure my leaders wouldn't mind me saying that. Um, and and in, in essence, you can use this tool, this communication tool, to also show where you sit relative to your competitors or your, your peers. And then once they absorb that information, you can then challenge the leadership team to say, well, you know, where do you want to, where do you want to set the dial? And that's what this. This is what this picture became known as in line. It became known as a dial. And you could always talk to, well, you know, where's that going to put us on the dial? Or how is that, how far is that going to move the dial? And as I said, it just became one of those tools which stuck and, and became really useful for me to, to push that sustainability agenda. So, and again, a call out to, you know, Carlsberg and Unilever, you know, doing a lot of, a lot of good work and, and have done for a number of years. And you can see in that sustainability leadership space, I, that's my personal view as to where our dial currently sits. I think we're just nudging into that sustainability leadership space, but still have a lot to do. I think that's the exciting thing for me, particularly around the carbon neutral. And, and you know, Sally alluded to this, is that, yes, you, you do require carbon offsets and carbon offsets are a, a tonne of carbon, but there's so many co-benefits that sit behind those, the right projects. Um, and Sally talked about strategically aligned projects, and that's exactly the phrase I use. Um, I don't talk about it as a ton of carbon. I talk about what are the projects out there which are aligned to our brands and aligned to our vision, and you know how do we you know invest more heavily in those types of projects. So it becomes more than just a story about being net zero or being carbon neutral. It's about the positive impact um, that you, you're bringing to the environment, and that's. In that never before have I, I thought that we finally have got access all the, to all the tools, we've got access to all the levers now to, to resolve climate change. For me now, it's about what else can we do on that journey to restore the environment and the ecology back to where it should be to support a sustainable future. So it's an incredibly exciting time and, and some you know wonderful opportunities opening up. And the last slide, again, I just wanted to emphasise that there's a big opportunity to be, be creative, um, to be positive, um, to look at all the, you know, the opportunities that arise, sometimes out of the blue. Um, and to be honest, going, you know, there's things that have come out of the woodwork as a consequence of being carbon neutral certified that I just never imagined at the time. And, you know, you can see here on the left, this is our New Belgium Brewing, um, they brewed a beer um, earlier this year, they called it tor Torched Earth, and they basically just used the ingredients that they thought would be available um, after climate change has, has, has ravaged the, the earth. So, um, you know, they used, for example, instead of using hops to bitter the beer, they were using um, daisies as, as a bittering. Anyway, the beer tastes foul, to cut a long story short, the, the beer tastes really bad and it was quite deliberate because it was just pointing to the long-term impacts of climate change. And they ran a, you know, they ran a story behind this that's a full page ad in the New York Times, you can see there as well, um, in that they were basically sticking it to the Fortune 500 companies that didn't have a strong climate ambition. Um, and, and that was something that I felt particularly proud of um, in that they were willing to go after other companies, knowing that they were owned by Lion, who are in turn owned by Kieran, but felt that Lion and Kieran had sufficiently strong and robust climate strategy that they could take aim at other companies that didn't. Um, so whilst I thought it was a really clever sort of marketing campaign um, and drew attention to the brand, overall, I just thought it was just an incredible reinforcement of the work that we've done to date on climate change. And again, Stein Lager, you can see them pushing ahead um, with their Carbon Zero, which it's called in New Zealand, um, and, and the marketing team is starting to warm up to what the opportunities are as, as a consequence of being carbon zero. So one of the pitches we're going for 
carbon neutral product was, you know, increased brand loyalty and increased brand sales. But, you know, that only works if the marketing team actually get behind it. Um, so I felt at the time I felt really exposed, you know, driving that carbon neutral product. Um, but, and so relieved when I started to see marketing, you know, pick it up and, and start running these types of promotions. So we have seen an uplift on the sales for Steinberg as a consequence of the carbon neutral commitment. The AH, the solar panels there, again, we, we did a PPA in New South Wales, but what was unique about it, we offered that PPA to our customers. Um, so the pubs and the clubs, we had about 200 sign up to that um, renewable PPA. And that was a bit of a twist on the on the conventional PPA. And we talked about it as an aggregated, you know, PPA across the industry. So um, like Scott, we only have one PPA running at the moment, but obviously have ORAs on a few others um, around Australia. And the top right hand corner is, is one of our offset projects that we, we talk about in, in co-benefit language in terms of providing the, um, I guess, the investment to foster the you know, Indigenous um, practice of the cool burnings on the savannas up in Arnhem Land and the importance of that in terms of biodiversity, but also the importance of that in being able to foster that Indigenous knowledge and ensure that, you know, it doesn't get lost as well as ultimately, um, you know, helping with the, the climate change piece. So, and again, a nice, we, we launched our Reconciliation Action Plan. It's just been approved by Reconciliation Australia. Um, you know, quite a bold move for an alcohol company. Um, and we were... I think I can honestly say we were quite scared stepping into that space, a um, lot of hesitation, but having taken the step and starting the conversation, um, that's just been a, just a wonderful experience for the line employees and just the importance of starting the conversation and, and not sort of stepping back and um, thinking and assuming the worst and, and actually having those conversations with Indigenous leaders and, and putting it in perspective. So. Um, particularly proud of our commitment to Reconciliation Australia and, and again, um, just highlights the type of um, creativity and, and purpose that you can bring to a, a sustainable um, a sustainability strategy. So that's that's all I have. Thank you for your attention and I'll, I'll go back to, um, to Joe. Fantastic. Thank you, Justin. Um, amazing as always. The, um, I guess from my perspective, people can see now why I say I have the best job in the world. I get to work with these amazing leaders and um, I get up every day thinking, you know, what fantastic things are going to happen today. So it, it, and you just hear these stories day in, day out. It's, it's fantastic and it's a great opportunity to get some of these things, the more holistic things around um, net zero out there as well as just talking about the actual um, nitty gritty and implementation of the technical aspects of it. Um, I think there's some great questions in there, Jared, which I'll get you to do in a moment, but I, I just wanted to ask um, Sally, as sometimes we get hit by, you know, our, our organisation isn't the size of Coke or Lion, you know, like, um, and some of what you say may not be applicable to our organisation. So from your perspective, like what would you say to organisations that are at the beginning of their journey? Like where, where would you think that they should start? And then Scott, if, if you could sort of perhaps talk about when you've done those easy win projects, what like to start dealing with those much harder projects, what kinds of things did you deal with? And Justin, if you can just talk about the, um, how you approached your management team, because, you know, it's quite a, a unique way that you've gone about some of these things that I'm always fascinated by. So Sal, over to you. Yeah, Joe, I wonder if, um, to be honest, for years we were overwhelmed by the task of thinking that because we didn't have the internal scale or capability or even resources as far as, you know, for example, energy management being a standalone function like some of our bigger counterparts, that this wasn't a journey for us. But I think being a member of the program and basically having our hand held throughout it, 
um, we actually did have the skills that mattered. We don't need an energy engineer because we've got Nick and Anna and Steve to come in and tell us what to do. What we needed were people that understood our value chain, that understood our business, that understood um, the change management process, that had were able to bring together multiple stakeholders. And that's the sort of um, capability that's within any organisation. Anyone can be taught how to upload data from an energy bill and to get some basic insights out of it. We're not the ones that are making the decisions or the determination on what opportunities we pursue, we're getting really good quality guidance and advice. And I think the fact that there's so much synergy, we're three very different organisations and different sizes and different um, organisational structures. And yet there's so much alignment between the three. I think we're reading each other's playbook and seeing things that resonate with us because, you know, it, it, and, and I think that's because this is a, um, you know, existing way that we're navigating this and we're following leaders that have gone before us. So I actually don't think the fact that um, the size, scale or capability within your organisation should limit you at all. I think the bigger thing is recognising the need for your business to do this and the relevance and this moment in time where we we're basically don't have an opportunity not to be part of this movement that secures um, our future for future generations. Fantastic, thanks Sal. And Scott? Sure. Um, I suppose from uh, from a couple of different perspectives. Um, so yeah, I suppose if you're if you're part of an organisation that's uh, that has made this sort of commitment, um, one of the uh, the approaches that has worked fairly well for us is is having that uh, internal price on carbon um, to basically allow for not only the the, the savings um, of, of whatever project you're currently looking at to be to be felt and, and known here and now, but what what are the future benefits? What what are the uh, potential offsets that you're offsetting that you no longer need because you're doing this project? Um, mm. And then I suppose if you're uh, in a position where you haven't actually made um, or sort of leaning towards making that sort of commitment, um, one of the uh, one of the things that uh, we've done fairly effectively as well is with all these projects what including what, what's the additionality of it? Um, so how, how does doing this project from a net zero carbon perspective, how does that positively impact operational efficiencies? How does that positively impact quality or food safety or personnel safety for that matter? How does it de-risk the organisation in other ways um, with some of the approaches that uh, have worked quite well for us? And Justin. Yeah, look, I, I agree strongly with what Sally and Scott have just said. Um, as I said, I, I took, I've been in line for three years and I, I guess I, when I started there, I took, you know, six months to, to learn the culture and to learn where the, the pressure points were in the organisation to push the sustainability agenda. And I think if you've been on that sustainability, if it's been part of your role for a long time, as it has been for mine, you, you're still adjusting to this incredible flip we're seeing where previously you've been pushing into executives and now we're just starting to see the pull because they're reading about climate change, they're seeing what their competitors are doing and what their peers are doing and they might just, if you're lucky, be looking for a way to say, well, how are we going to do this as a company or how are we going to do that as an organisation? And that's your way in, right? You, you've got to drive through that as hard as you can. So for, for an FMCG, as I said, it's typically, you know, conversations about market share and they, they, are, they can be sensitive to what competitors are, are doing. So that can often be a good pressure point. Um, on a more positive sense, like Scott was saying, what, where are the co-benefits? How is it going to attract talent in our organisation? How is it going to retain the talent in our organisation? Um, what are these, you know, how, how will it reflect on us when we, we go to the government, you know, and want some assistance to, you know, help with a heat pump, for example, Joe, to give a live <laughs> example. Uh, so, yeah, I think you've got to, as a sustainability practitioner, you know you've, you've got to have that toolkit and be able to come at a problem with, all, with many different angles until you, you, you find a way through. And as I said, it's just nice now, it's becoming that little bit easier, as I said, because a lot of the executive teams are wondering what, what role do we play as a company um, in this, in this you know, emerging crisis? What do we need to do? So they're looking for advice. So that, that push isn't as hard as it used to be. It's fantastic. And I guess, um, you know, just looking at those kind of things where we were talking about the um, a collaboration project and Justin's just raised it, you know, looking at heat pumps with 
been able to identify in a sector through some of the um, pathway projects that we're working on that many have the same issue. So we've been able to assist with uh, a common part of uh, a feasibility study and then each organisation will go down the path of the site specific work. So that's uh, what I meant by that ability to um, and willingness to share information to solve, you know, common problems. Um, Jared, I'll hand over to you to start asking some of the questions that have been put out there. Will do. Thanks, Joe. And uh, just to, if, I, if I may offer a quick comment there, uh, Justin, you said that, that that move from push to, uh, to pull, it's definitely coming across. If it's been uh, some nine months since you presented uh, at our Express conference last November, and, and I recall the takeaway from them was, you know, if you want to get something happening in energy, you, you really have to tie it to existing programs, business strategies, that sort of thing. Um, otherwise, it's really hard to get it happening. It's almost like you had to, it's almost like a little bit, just be that little bit more clever in getting that happening. But you can really feel the change now. This is, that, that, that direction's flipped. And, and to think that's, this is like less than a year and this change, this is this fantastic change. So, um, yeah, great to hear. Great to see that update. Um, I've got a, we've got a question here about packaging. Uh, Justin, I think, did you say 50% uh, of the uh, embodied uh, carbon within when you're, when you're having that beer is, is from the packaging? Um, the question there was actually directly to Blackmores, but I think it applies to the entire panel, um, was, was how are you approaching this challenge with your suppliers? Um, I'll go first, um, and the, the problem because we've got a, a slightly um, additional problem to packaging, solving packaging. The reason it always comes up, no matter where you go, everyone wants to know how you're tackling it because it literally is one of the most challenging areas of emissions to address mm -hmm. um, for many reasons. We've got the additional problem, or not problem, but complexity in being a medicine um, because we've got to obviously have stability studies on every single format that we do. And say, for example, a multivitamin that might have 20 different components in it compared to a marine oil compared to a simple vitamin B um, tablet would have a very different profile as far as their exposure and their vulnerability to um, things like moisture and, and light and things like that. So what it's, it's meant is that we've resulted in, a, you know, an existing packaging format that ends up being quite high in emissions. But saying that, it also gives us a very long shelf life, which stops a lot of waste. And, you know, 50 times we could have easily gone, we'll just shove everything in clear PET bottles. And basically everything would have had a three month shelf life instead of a two year shelf life. And we would have had an insane problem with product wastage, which, you know, what we've got to be careful of in approaching packaging is being very clear on the problem we are trying to solve because we've got issues to do with recyclability and a very complex system that we're playing into there. And we're also managing our emissions profile as well. So that's where we've started on our um, packaging journey at the moment. Um, it's a cross-functional team um, covering everyone from consumer marketing, sustainability, procurement, operations, packaging technology, our Asia teams who have very different needs as well. And we're doing this as a collaborative approach, um, including looking at a lot of different things, because to be honest, it's not just about protecting the quality and the potency, re-looking um, at our packaging formats could actually be a significant opportunity. We have started with rebasing a lot of the facts because there's a lot of mythology when it comes to packaging. Um, some of it was based on things that have become folklore over the years, like, for example, what certain regulatory requirements are that, you know, need to be understood and broken down. And other things are things like life cycle assessments that were done years ago, and those have changed because energy markets have changed, and that's fundamentally changed the footprint of some of the components that you're using. The other thing that's evolving is the recycling systems, and there's a, a need for us to keep focusing on those national packaging targets as the North Star in that particular um, uh, sense. The one thing um, that all of that, as an example, if I had one more person send me the bamboo bottle lids and tell us that this is the future of sustainable packaging because it's made of bamboo and therefore it looks sustainable when it actually is, you know, a contaminant within our recycling systems. And obviously there's a lot of sustainability issues to do with, you know, the origins of that material in itself. It really highlights the need for us to be very fact-based and clear on the problem we're solving in the recommendations that we make. 
the one thing that will require a lot of bravery is whatever we come up with in the coming years, and this will be a years long journey, not a months long journey, is what we recommend could end up challenging what consumers think is more sustainable. Because um, they do love things like bamboo lids. And if we offer them something that could, for example, be a clever plastic, they, you know, that that's not something that consumers love. And so we're all on a journey, both internally and with our suppliers and with our consumers, to make sure that we're um, offering, I suppose, simplicity on and clarity on the problem that we're trying to solve and how this actually does it. We're not there yet, but I think for the first time in years, we've actually got the right people around the table to how, be able to, to model out a pathway to take us forward. Thank you so much. And uh, Sally, I'm, I'm hearing uh, the, the whole leadership type uh, training and things coming back of bringing people on a journey and then and then coming through with suggestions. You're like, great, we've got suggestions. Oh, no, <laughs> telling us down the wrong one. That's quite a communication management uh, plan right there. Eh? Very good. Uh, Scott, uh, or Justin, you're, you're off mute there. Uh, uh, Justin, something on, on packaging, uh, how you're tra uh, tracking uh, emissions for packaging? Yeah, sure. I mean, I make Sally very jealous because we're, we're glass and aluminium and, and stainless steel kegs for most of it. So, um, you know, material that can be recycled many times over. And um, a common question I get a lot is what's, what's better for the planet? Is it an aluminium can or a glass bottle? Um, and it's a very, it's to Sally's point about life cycle analysis, it's quite a, a complicated question to answer and has many dependencies as to what's better. One of the key drivers though is recycled content. And the more recycled content you can get into both aluminium and glass, the lower the emissions intensity of that material. Um, so we do work quite closely with Coke on the CDS, um, the various um, schemes around Australia. And we know that by getting customers to use those schemes, um, we can get more recycled content in our bottles or our cans and that can bring down the, the carbon intensity. So that's the, there's a beautiful nexus between carbon and, and recycled content or carbon and, and the circular economy. And um, it's an area that we need to, to drive, continue to drive and, and fortunately, with, with big packaging producers like Visi, um, you know, they've been quite open with their commitment to Australian industry and increasing the recycled content of glass. I think they're running full page ads recently about increasing glass recycled content from, you know, 35 to, to 70%, which 70% is what you can achieve um, quite easily. And that's done in New Zealand and Germany and Japan and many other countries. So, again, um, you know, loading it up with that, recycle glass or the colour um, can really bring the life cycle emissions of your, of your product down. But I, I again, um, I can hear, an element, I can sense a bit of frustration with Sally because you do, you get all these ideas and, but the, the it's quite scientific in terms of, um, you know, which pathway you, you take and it requires careful consideration. And I mean, we had a good example for Steinlager in New Zealand where the life cycle analysis was using a, um, a glass emission factor, which was, you know, above one, which, you know, is assuming a 0% recycled content in glass, whereas in New Zealand, it's up around 60, 70%, and we're going, oh, hang on, you know, that's, that's way too high. Um, so, you, yeah, you've really got to dig underneath to, to find out precisely, you know, what your packaging footprint looks like and, and what are the levers that you're going to pull to, um, to bring the emissions intensity down. Fantastic, thank you. And, and, and Scott, I suggest maybe you're sitting in the middle of the, the two there with uh, a, a bit more variability in your uh, manufacturing uh, materials. Yeah, very much so. I mean, our, our glass footprint is uh, is relatively small. Our uh, our aluminium can one is is quite large, um, and likewise our, our PET. So. Um, PET wise, uh, you know, we're, we're moving as much as possible towards 100% uh, re uh, recycled content. We've got that um, for all of our, our smaller bottles at the moment, about one litre and, and less are all 100% recycled PET. Um, and we're moving more and more towards uh, how, do we, how do we increase that in, uh, in the larger bottles. Um, we have a very, um, very pragmatic uh, packaging team uh, within the business who 
are really good um, actually at, at pushing back on on marketing and so forth uh, in in some of these these areas. So their their primary focus is on you know new product development and bringing new new things and new packs and so forth to the market. Um, but they they do it um, with a, a, a total sustainable lens over over the whole lot. We're not uh, they're not looking for the just the technical um, recyclability um, definition of, of anything that we actually put out there on the market, whether that be you know your primary packs, your cans and bottles and so forth, your secondary stuff, um, the the cartons and and that sort of stuff, and any tertiary that goes with you know pallets of, of product and so forth as well. Um, they'll always look for what is what is the practical um, recyclability of those products and so forth as well. So our 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 strategy when it comes to packaging basically is around to use the minimal amount. So it's a lightweighted as much as is much as possible um, to, to have the maximum amount of, of recycled content uh, within uh, the packs themselves. Um, and then to, uh, to work with you know, partners like Lion and, and so forth on the, on the container deposit schemes around the country um, to ensure that, you know, we, we get that back uh, as much as possible. And um, you know, we're, We've uh, we've just signed an MOU with uh, a couple of other businesses, Pact, uh, Asahi, and so forth, around um, building our own uh, recycle PET plant, um, so that we can sort of close that loop, if you like, as and make that loop as as small as possible uh, in in bringing um, recycle packs back to the market. Good one. Good progress. Thanks, uh, Scott. And. Uh... The next question we've got is about uh, energy management systems. Uh, just wondering about um, who, uh, you know, if you've got these in place and how formal they are and, and how, how they are being used to support heading towards uh, net zero emissions, or, or is it uh, covered in other, in other ways? What's, uh, maybe we'll start with you again, Sally, where, where are you at with uh, energy management systems? Yeah, so one of our achievements in the last year has been to introduce an ENMS, which we did again as, as a partner of the program here. Um, and um, it is, it's an enabler basically for your net zero goal because net zero encompasses, that's basically sits, is the umbrella that sits above multiple programs. Um, and energy management as a discipline sits beneath that. I think having a good ENMS shows the need to um, really focus on that governance side of it. Because when I look at, you know, Blackmore's 15 years ago, and again, having that very strong cultural pull, um, what was missing was the governance and the proceduralization of a lot of this stuff. So that if one of our amazing people left the business, all of that way of them doing things left with them. And I think a lot of um, our success in being able to meet our net zero target will be about making sure that we do capture that governance and the systemization side together um, with the target and the goal so that that becomes operationalized and, and um, uh, having management systems, you know, across, um, you know, the group is, is our way that we're, we're approaching that. Thanks, Sally. And uh, Justin, ENMS? fully supported, implemented, audited? Oh, I don't know about audited. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely strong in terms of instrumentation. I, I think I spoke earlier about having these four levels of, of sub-reading across the large sites, um, which is quite helpful for, for digging into finding the next opportunity. And again, the skill resides with Sally. Uh, mentioned the skill resides for the individuals to be able to interpret that information and, and to proactively uh, look at it um, when it goes off track to find out why and, and address the root cause. So, uh, and, and Scott had a really good comment earlier about, you know, you take consistency over accuracy, um, mm. <laughs> which, is, which is a really clever way of saying it in, the, in terms of making sure you have a level of confidence um, in your data as well as crucial. It's, it's really hard to start a conversation um, with the breweries or even, you know, the executive teams the, if they're finding gaps in the data or finding holes in the data. It's, it's kind of a, a house of cards if, if you get that wrong. And, and so, yes, we, we have it. We're, we're just starting to look at an enterprise energy management system. So, um, you know, how do we aggregate that information across the, the network and, and use that as a basis for to comparing how one brewery is operating versus another brewery? I think we've got to be pretty careful because, you know, breweries use different equipment, different ages of equipment, and um, it can become 
a, a very deep rabbit hole if you're trying to understand why, how one brewery performs differently to another. Um, so we're just going to take it slow and initially and, and start with the basic fundamental information and hopefully, you know, over, over time we can run some small experiments on, for example, comparing boiler efficiency or comparing pasteuriser efficiency and, and perhaps you can get some sort of deeper insights as to what best practice looks like across the network as opposed to just a single site. Good. Thank you. And I certainly know the uh, DICER is trying to support uh, such benchmarking across uh, whether it be a process unit or a factory line. So uh, uh, just know that the foundation's coming in place. Um, Scott, uh, ENMS, uh, where are you guys at? Yeah, um, look, it, it's it's definitely, it, it, it's almost the ultimate cliche, you know, what what you can uh, measure, you can manage and so forth. And what we've, uh, what we've sort of found around our sites is there's, um, there's a bit of a patchwork uh, of what uh, what level of, of data and analysis um, that we've actually got available to us to be able to do um, good energy management uh, across the sites. Um, some are quite good, others are sort of fairly um, rudimentary in, in that space. Um, but having having sort of made the the commitments now and so forth around uh, around net zero uh, and got the buy-in and the engagement of the senior leadership. Um, one of the things that we we have actually found is uh, we've we've got a well virtually a dedicated resource now in one of our plants that uh, his uh, his sole focus is on uh, is on utilities in in particular in the in the energy space. Um, and in the last couple of months, you know, he's, he's uncovered projects that are worth uh, one one in particular. I think is about half a million dollars on uh, on one boiler system alone. Um, so you sort of start to put up those type of numbers and, and it sort of turns heads fairly quickly um, and it's, well, okay, what, what have we got to do to, uh, to get this uh, capability now across the rest of, uh, rest of the production lines, rest of the production sites uh, and, the, and the business in general. So that's, uh, that's rapidly evolving, let's say, in, uh, in our space. It's a desirable skill set. So as far as getting um, people to want to take it on and have a bit more ownership over it, it actually, as far as, you know, um, building people's career and making them, you know, more attractive um, as far as their own development goes, this is a really attractive skill set. And that should be something that, you know, helps get support for rolling out and having people that own and embrace it across the group. What's their name, Scott? Did you, did you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe, anything for you before I, I can I can press into some more questions? We've got about ten. No, minutes. go ahead quick with fire. your questions, we'll please. Yeah. All right, uh, let me try a few quick fire ones. We've got about seven or eight minutes left. Let's see how we go. Uh, Scott, 100% uh, recycled uh, um, bottles uh, announced through yep. last year and the advertising for that. Have you yep. seen an impact on emissions uh, and energy use because of that change? Uh, most definitely. Uh, so packaging uh, is is basically of the of the five pillars that I actually popped up there before. Um, packaging is the largest contributor um, to our overall uh, carbon footprint, and within that, um, you know, we've we've got the three pack formats. We've got the the glass, which is relatively small, and then we've got in terms of uh, tonnages and so forth, uh, cans and PET, which are are about the same. Um, the the switch to the recycled content, which uh, in total now from a PET perspective is uh, about 60%, um, which I'm actually quite happy to say is ahead of where the Europeans are. Um, yay us, we've actually got one up on the Europeans for once. Um, it has made a massive difference uh, in terms of the, uh, the carbon footprint um, of, the, uh, of the total packaging um, portfolio that we've, that we've actually got. And you know, we're sort of now pushing ahead with, uh, with increasing that in, uh, in the cans and in the glass bottles and so forth as well. Um, along with that, uh, you know, increasing the recyclability uh, of of that uh, of the PET stream as well. Um, you know, we're like, like all FM, FMCG and, and all businesses. Basically, you know, we're we're effectively a, a marketing company. So, you know, the product's got to look um, look look the goods really, uh, and. A couple of things that we've sort of done in that space um, around sort of putting a, a slight blue tint in uh, in some of the PET. Um, when you recycle PET over time, it tends to yellow um, and starts to sort of not look that great once you, you run it through a recycling process um, a couple of times. So putting a little bit of uh, a blue tint in there um, tends to keep it 
uh, from going um, that that sort of yellowish and so forth uh, within there within there as well. Um, one of the other things uh, I might be sort of preempting something here, but we've uh, we've done it uh, in the Fijian business uh, in the last two years. I think we've done it now in the New Zealand one as well, and fairly sure it's happening in Australia uh, soon. Is uh, taking the the Sprite bottles from uh, from green to clear PET as well. Um, green PET. Yes, it's recyclable, technically. Practically, yes, likewise, but it's not it, It's not a highly sought after uh, stream, for example. So there's no, um, you know, the, the examples that Sally was sort of talking about from a, um, a product integrity perspective, there's, there's no drivers from that, um, that side of thing. It's purely a, a brand and, and marketing side of things. Um, so basically educating consumers on, on the benefits of, of doing that. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I'll keep moving. We'll try and get a few through a few here. Uh, carbon price. Has somebody put a, a, an internal carbon price? I think it may have been Justin. And, and, and how is that being used to incentivise behavioural change? Um, and how did you set the, the carbon price? Um, any critical success factors around that? Well, the, the carbon price comes about through our, our carbon neutral commitment. So in effect, um, buying carbon offsets it sets a carbon price mm. because every ton of carbon you'd be saving one offset, and and therefore, um, you know, Eureka, you've you've got a carbon price in the business, and it's and then it's about I guess educating the um, the businesses that there's an additional savings on energy um, projects by incorporating the cost of that carbon offset in the business case, and then so that's really where we've um, where we've landed at this point in time. It wasn't deliberately. Put, it, it wasn't the driver wasn't going carbon neutral wasn't an internal carbon price it's just been one of those helpful secondary benefits to uh, I guess gonna get an understanding of, of what a what an internal carbon price actually does to the way that people think about um, projects mm. and future investments so a nice a nice um, side effect for sure and there we see I think LGC price around thirty five dollars so there's your there's your price for carbon right there thirty five dollars a ton done um, yeah. what what to set the price is a, it's a it's a difficult question and it, it really depends on what angle you're going to come at it but again you've got acute price forecasted to be above 30 you know dollars a unit like you say you've got spot price for lgc circa 35 they they're approaching parity um and then all of a sudden it becomes cheaper to enter into a, a renewable power purchase agreement than it does to buy carbon offsets yeah um, and that, I think that's one thing that I've found is that's really positive because I'd, I'd, I'd rather at this point in time be, you know, investing, you know, in a, in a renewable PPA than, you know, um, lots of carbon offsets. I'll just add to that the, uh, the VIX, the Victorian one, $82 per tonne. That has just taken off in the last month or so. So those Victorian manufacturers with those projects ready to go that can claim VIX, go for it. Uh, so another one, another one here for, for you, uh, Justin. I'm not sure how we'll go within a, a one or two minute answer. It sounds like quite a, a wide question here. Um, what is Lion's strategy in electrifying their heating demand? Uh, heat pumps, I suppose, is um, where we're, and it's, it's the same with a lot of the beverage manufacturers are, are shifting into that space. Um, so we, and that's really something we're working closely on with the sustainability advantage um, program, as well as arena and, and looking at that type of technology. It still feels a little bit risky. I think um, we, we don't see a large uptake at this point. I know you've got one at your home, Jared, but um, <laughs> at, a, at a broader scale, um, I guess we're still feeling a little bit uncertain about the technology and the interdependencies, I think is where the, where the devil is in the detail. Yeah, we certainly need some local capability building around that and, and seeing someone to take that first step and uh, for part of their plant. But I think we're not far away and we, we certainly see uh, that increase in there. Um, oh, Joe, this I think is a question for you then. Sustainability advantage, is there an equivalent in Queensland? And I'll open to that question. If not, how do we get that going up there? Yeah, well, no, there is no other sustainability advantage. And I think um, Scott, Justin and Sally would probably um, agree with that in the other states. However, there are many, many um, 
opportunities, particularly around net zero and packaging and those kind of things that the other states are starting to look at and probably some of those large organisations that operate nationally will be able to fill you in much more than I can on some of those, but we could certainly tie you in with um, some of the people that we work with. I know there's you know a lot going on in textiles and net zero currently, particularly South Australia, Queensland and Victoria. Mm. Put that in the pipeline. We've got a few contacts up there. We'll see where Queensland must, must, must be next on the list to, uh, to be getting some programs going. So Joe, I'll, I'll invite you to our next meeting we have with the <laughs> ministers up there. Um, that's uh, just going through some questions here. So just trying to find one that we can we can handle in the next uh, minute or two. Uh, let, let's go to, to Sally again. Uh, benchmarking on energy efficiency. Uh, we saw from from Justin uh, a, a level of um, uh, kilo, kilojoules or so per kiloliter. Gigajoules, it may have been. And where are you, Sally? You've got a much broader portfolio in products. How would you benchmark uh, and how that's coming uh, coming along? We don't do it by product. We do it by um, so our three. We, we're a very big believer in having very simple, clear targets and just making sure everyone's on board with those. So I spoke before about integrating those into our balanced scorecard. We measure our overall emissions. We measure our in emissions intensity as um, relative to doses produced at our manufacturing to get a manufacturing efficiency um, metric. And then we also do it per thousand units sold as a sales metric and, and that's it. So to be honest, we've kept it pretty simple. We mm. haven't gone broad in how we um, approach that. But, you know, as I said, we're very much on a journey about improving our carbon literacy across the group. So, um, you know, I can see um, a lot of elements where I would expect our program to mature over the coming years. But I think one of the reasons that we've been able to take clear early steps is we have kept it relatively simple. Yet another lesson learned, many thanks. Um, I'll now just, uh, I think we're ready to close. Joe, anything anything from yourself before we close? The, no, this? just that, to say thank you to our amazing panellists. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Scott, Sally, Justin, uh, great to have you with us today. Um, a, lot of, a lot of gems and a lot of insight there. And uh, whether that be uh, consistency over over accuracy, uh, the need to have to have a Mac curve, or or the need to um, uh, move the dial. Uh, so many things, so many great lessons learnt there uh, from you all today. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for the um, opportunity. So uh, looking ahead for tomorrow now, and up on the screen you'll see we have the uh, the sessions there for tomorrow. So. We're going to take this further uh, with looking at actually tracking uh, carbon productivity. Um, so, going that we, we have got presentation tomorrow from uh, Schneider Electric, from Endeavour, and from Symbol. Talk about different platforms of how you can track this uh, the carbon emissions, and then how you can use that information for, to make decisions. So that's our session kicking off at uh, at uh, one o'clock tomorrow, and then and we have another session. The final session is three o'clock tomorrow afternoon and talking about the case for energy productivity innovations. And we'll be hearing from end users, very similar to the panel that we had today, about uh, how they've made the business case. Uh, and and you, I think you'll hear similar terms like co-benefits or, or non-energy benefits or looking at overall productivity. Uh, but there's, there's going to be some great insights there from, from end users and energy consultants uh, joining us then tomorrow afternoon. Um, at the same time, as mentioned before, we've got the uh, the parallel sessions from RACE and you can flick between channels. Uh, RACE where we have lots of interactive sessions and all about innovation uh, versus uh, say a A2EP a little bit more, a little bit more here and now and, and lessons learned over the last 12 months of those that are implementing. Uh, so yeah, both are being recorded. You've got the opportunity to, to be able to watch both uh, if you, or the other one if you miss it and uh, watch that next week when we put those videos out. Uh, so all that's left then is to say once again, Thank you so much to our, our presenters today. Joe, thank you so much for coordinating today. Much appreciated. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon and look forward to seeing you tomorrow.